Welcome to K9 Revolution Radio. Presented by K9 Revolution Dog Training, enhancing the dog and owner relationship through education, balance, and pack instinct. All right, here for another episode of K9 Revolution Radio. This is a uh, emergency episode. What? You didn't emergency. tell me that. <laughs> So uh, for those that don't know, here at The Revolution, we do what we call continued education for our trainers, where every week we uh, study some material, uh, preferably that we haven't read before or digested before. We discuss it, we, we kind of break it down, and then we kind of talk about it, you know, develop ourselves, develop our understanding of dogs, people, everything that we do here at The Revolution. Uh, so the book we're currently reading right now is The Dog's Mind by Bruce Fogel. All right. Uh, it says the dog's mind, understanding your dog's behavior. It's a great book, and uh, we're on page 112 right now. We're reading about the psychology of the dog mind. We're reading about social behavior. We're reading about aggression. All right. Oh, a lot geez. of people. Uh, we like aggression. We like aggression. <laughs> Tone it down. Default aggressive. Good to go. <laughs> uh, you know, but a lot of people have a, a misunderstanding of what aggression actually is in the dog. You know, aggression is just one of those traits that all dogs have some form of aggression. We're not going to go deep into that discussion, uh, but the section we're reading right now, starting on page 112 of this book, is so important. A um, lot of good information packed in these couple of pages right here that we just wanted to sit down and, and read through some of the highlights and talk about it on the podcast to continue to educate everybody else that's listening to our content watching our videos, talking to us, our alumni, those that are maybe across the world, that kind of stuff, listening to us. So this is a great book, The Dog's Mind, starting on page 112. The actual title of the section is Dominance Aggression, but I want you to think about the word dominance as we're reading this, okay? So I got some highlights here. Boys, if we got some, if we got some highlights that I'm missing, pause so we can read through that. We'll read some of the highlights, we'll talk about it. And keep going. The section's about two pages long, three pages long. So we're going to read through this. Good to go. All right. All right. So right off, right off, starting in the book, it says that dogs are pack animals. They simply don't expect equality. Dang. Stop right there. You know what I'm saying? Stop right there. Holy. <laughs> simply don't expect first, equality. First two sentences right off the bat. Good to go. Right. So we know that dogs are pack animals and we know they don't expect equality, right? So that means in a human pack, like in your family, your family is your dog's pack, or your dog's viewing you from their perspective, and we challenge you to view things from your dog's perspective as you're working with them, but your family is, is the pack, your dog's pack, okay? So think about it from this perspective, dogs are pack animals, our family is the pack, they don't expect equality. So a lot of people that we talk with, you may have multiple dogs, a lot of people ask the question, you know, is it fair that so-and-so, you know, dog number one does this, but dog number two is not doing that? Well, yes, it's fair, you know, because dogs don't ex ex expect equality. You have to set the boundaries, set the tone, tell them who's in what position on the hierarchy. You have to make sure that you are higher up in the hierarchy to them. We're going to go to more into detail on it right now, but real quick, that statement right there, they simply don't expect equality, very important. So keep that in mind as we keep reading here. All right, back to the book here. Uh, we're gonna go, we're gonna skip the next sentence. We're gonna go to the third sentence here. The dog's natural genetic predisposition is to find his place in the pecking order, the dominance hierarchy. Boom, stop right there. <laughs> Are we gonna make it through all of these? This might be like a three hour podcast. <laughs> right, so first of all, we said that the dog doesn't expect equality. Now we're saying that the genetic uh, natural genetic predisposition is to find his place in the pecking order, which means that in the pack there is a pecking order. So think about it like this. Your family is your dog's pack. Just like in the wild, the wolf, have, the wolf has a pack, right? Just like in the business world, if you work for a company or organization, there is a hierarchy. Who's the CEO? Who's the COO? Who's the manager? Who's the supervisor? You know, who's the team leader? That type of stuff. You know, in the military, who's the commanding officer? Who's the executive officer? Who's the master at arms? You know, all this kind of stuff, depending on where you're at in the military. So there's a pecking order in everything. You know what I'm saying? 
and the family, you know, the husband thinks he runs the family, but the wife, you know, she's, she's keeping him in check, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> All right, but there is a pecking order, so don't think that there is no pecking order for your dog. And if, you're, if, you're, if you have the thought process that your dog doesn't need a pecking order, or that your dog is equal to you or your kids or your other dogs, you're setting yourself up for some uh, bad behavior. Well, and regardless, regardless of what you think, the exactly. dog is make is is finding where he is in that pecking order from day one. Day one, your dog is naturally, instinctually looking. Okay, where do I where where am I in this pecking order? And so, you know, if you're not ready to uh, to handle that, you know, you may be below him on the pecking order. Yeah, exactly. we we all know what spot they want. Yeah. Number yeah. one. Yep. Yep. They got to figure it out. You know. So some dogs are going to push that envelope more. They're going to be more dominant. You know, they're going to be pushing the testing the limits, testing the limits, testing the boundaries, trying to push you around the house, try to control you and the family. Some dogs are subtler about it. Some dogs are not really that dominant, not displaying that much stuff, you know what I'm saying? So some uh, just want to do their own thing on their own terms, their own you know thing, what I mean? You know, but if you got that super dominant dog, this this discussion is very important. Mm -hmm. If your dog if you feel like your dog is controlling you around the house, if you're nervous at times trying to have people over because your dog is there, you know, or your dog's super aroused or super jacked up by things, you need to pay attention. You yeah. know what I'm saying? I mean, especially for those big things, but even everyday little small things, you know, what yeah. are we reinforcing? What are we allowing them to think, you know? So if my dog comes up to me, barks at me, starts nudging me to give attention, I subconsciously just start petting them. Yep. Well, they just dominated me, yep. you know what I mean? Yep. So that's reinforced. So there's all kinds of little things that play a factor in it. Exactly. All right, so we're going to go a couple sentences down. We're talking about testosterone surge, all right? So we're talking about puberty, talking about uh, that male dogs. Testosterone surge occurs at between six months and a year of age, yet the apparently sudden, unprovoked aggression, aggressive acts of dominant aggression, usually against members of the immediate family, frequently don't occur for another one to two years, right? So we're talking about puberty, we're talking about uh, highly dominant dogs that are starting to uh, show unprovoked aggressive acts of dominance aggression, or just dominant acts, right? Uh, usually against members of the immediate family, frequently don't occur for another one to two years after six months, so we're talking about somewhere between one to two years old, somewhere between six months and uh, two years old, so that's the kind of age frame we're looking at when we're talking about puberty, talking about uh, dogs that are showing dominance, right? So just keep that in mind. You may have a puppy, you don't see any issues, right? You got no problems. And then all of a sudden, between one to two years old, one and a half years old, you're starting to have some aggressive acts. Just out of nowhere. Out of nowhere, <laughs> unprovoked, right? Aggressive acts, uh, could be against your, uh, members of your family, could be against other people, you know? But this is all signs of dominance right? Your dog is now getting their surge of testosterone. They're starting to display dominance. You don't know what's going on. I don't know what to do. Don't, don't wait. You need professional help. You know what I'm saying? You need to listen to what we're talking about because if this uh, is continuing, if, if this is allowed to continue, there's going to be serious issues. You know, and I'm talking from experience because myself, the reason why I became a trainer is because I was going through this with my own dog. Very powerful, very big Doberman. And uh, between one to two years old, started to, uh, you know, unprovoked aggressive acts against me, against my wife, against other people, you know, and it came down to dominance. And once I figured out how to get into the mind and, and adjust his thinking and, and set him on, the, on our family hierarchy, no problems anymore, you know. But up until that point, we're freaking out. We don't know what to do, you know what I'm saying? So this, this could be what's going on, right? All right. Uh, Little See baby, that? Little, little lizard, lizard just jumped on me. Yep, yep. little baby lizard action. All right, so we're going to go to the next paragraph, the first sentence. First sentence reads that dominance aggression can be provoked in a in a myriad of ways and is a pack problem. A pack problem. So dominance aggression dominance is not your dog's problem. It's natural for them. It's the pack problem, which means there's probably a lack of leadership. You know what I'm saying? There's a lack of routine. There's a lack of structure, all these types of things. You know, we talk about all the time. Dogs need these. Dogs thrive on this routine, structure, you know, hierarchy, 
exercise, balanced out energy. They need this stuff because it is what they're getting naturally in a natural pack. You know what I'm saying? So dominance aggression is a pack problem. It means the pack has not been set up the right way. Right. You know what I'm saying? They need to get away from just putting it on the dog yep. and thinking about what are we doing as humans, you know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. again, I mean, we must have said it a hundred times, the dog understands what the dog understands. We need to make them understand in a way that they basically get it, not in a way that we get it, you know? Because yeah. they're not going to adjust to us. we got to kind of adjust to them in that sense. Yeah. Yep. we got to think about it from their perspective, yep. you know? And we may need some professional help, you know? We may need some training, professional training. 843-213-2676. Canine <laughs> Revolution <laughs> Dog Training. plug. <laughs> <laughs> so we may need some training to help us get to a point where we can maintain it, especially if we're really far gone on this, on this dominant scale. Like, let's say we got a puppy, no issues. A year old, now we're starting to see some issues. That, that ticker is ticking up. Because as your dog is practicing this stuff, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. Now you're in the extreme zone. You're going to need professional help to get your dog's mind a little bit rehabilitated to the point where they're going to be back set, reset onto some instincts and get you and your family on the right track. You know, And we know dog training is not just dog training. Mm. It's training you and your family. Nope. You know what I'm saying? Helping you guys uh, be set up for success. That's the, pr that's the primary purpose of it. You know what I'm saying? So uh, that may be something we need. You know what I'm saying? So it just has to be uh, put in the thought process there. All right. So now we're on uh, page 113. The dog's mine. Uh, all right. And we're talking. Let's breeze through this real quick. Uh, let's see. So top of the page, we're talking about... Uh, how we can provoke some of this dominance aggression stuff, all right? Some, some of it can be provoked by disturbing your dog, such as awakening him or moving him or ordering him to move from his resting place. How many people have we talked to that are dealing with this? Yeah. Some people say, my dog has sleep aggression because I woke him up and they're attacking me. That's dominance, right. you know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, I tried to move my dog off the couch and they attacked me, you know what I'm saying? That's dominance, right? That's what we're talking about. Uh, you can, it can be provoked by approaching his food. So we get this a lot, resource guarding. Mm -hmm. It's dominance, you know, approaching food or another dog approaching the food or your child approaching your dog while they're eating and your dog uh, is provoked into an attack, you know, that's dominance, right? His favorite person, my dog is protecting me. No, they're dominating you. They're owning you. They're, owning you. they're being dominant, right? Or his resting area, even if he's not in it. So his favorite spot on the couch, you know what I'm saying? You decide to walk by it, sit by it. Maybe a guest comes over, sits there. They get attacked. That's dominance. You may not even know what's going on. My dog just randomly attacked him. You know, my dog just randomly attacked my mom who was visiting. Well, your mom just happened to sit by your dog's favorite spot on the couch, and they were trying to say, that's my spot. Get away from it. You know what I'm saying? In dog language. You know what I'm saying? Uh, dominance aggression can be stimulated by petting. Ooh, that's a big one. A lot of people think that, uh, you know, they should be able to pet any dog. Some dogs don't appreciate that, you know. Even a dominant dog that has professional training, very well trained, they still may not appreciate petting by just anybody, you know what I'm saying? But that is a sign of dominance, you know what I'm saying? Uh, having collars and leads, leashes put on or off, right? Another big thing, because that's some form of control, right? Dog doesn't like that right without the proper associations conditioning all that type of stuff back to the book uh by being stared at or disciplined <laughs> you know how many times have you talked to somebody they're out in public they're walking at a park someone looks at their dog says hey pretty boy and then they get attacked that's dominance you know what i'm saying <laughs> his tail was wagging because <laughs> he wants to bite your face they're around you know what i'm saying <laughs> I've seen dogs where the person's like, my dog likes other dogs, you know, they're always wagging their tail. That Your dog is dom being dominant with other dogs and they start reacting, all this crazy stuff, right? Vader wagged his tail before he went for the kill, you know what I'm saying? I mean, yep. Just aroused. Oh yeah. Back to the book, uh, talking about ways we can provoke dominance aggression. It could be by grooming, nail cutting, toweling, such as drying them off, meeting in a narrow passageway where the dog feels he has the right of passage first walking down your hallway walking down your hallway or let's say you got a doggy door which we don't recommend after training you know <laughs> but let's say you got a doggy door and your dominant dog's coming in your uh, another dog's going out boom the dominant dog grabs the uh, other dog throws him down whatever 
sign of dominance right there. You know what I'm saying? Uh, back to the book. Discipline, either verbal or physical, can provoke dominance aggression. Just standing over a dog can be interpreted as a threat to his position and can invo invoke a dominant response. Right? So that goes back to dominant body language from the dog putting the dog putting the head over the shoulder of the other dog, that's a sign of dominance. Mm -hmm. So if I happen to approach and uh, be over, standing over a dog, that could be interpreted as dominance, depending on the dog, and the dog could react to that. You know what I'm saying? You know, so how about just your dog's hanging out and you're throwing your arm around them? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Hey, good boy, <laughs> love you. And it's so common when people walk up to pet dogs, that's the first thing they do is hunch down oh, over yeah. them. Oh, yeah. Start stroking just under the chin. Looking right out. Over the head, which is Showing another. their teeth because they're smiling. Yeah. <laughs> smiling, yeah. That's to a dog that could be snarling. Yeah. The first time yeah. I met Bane when Chad came back from California. I didn't know anything about dogs at this point. I just reached out, went over his head with petting. All I heard was Chad go say no. <laughs> so, little did I know in that scenario, yeah. setting myself up for a little bite action. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Luckily, Bane was uh, listening. He was—he knew where he was at in the hierarchy. And at Chad that looked point. pissed. I was like, "What's what? What, what happened?" I'm just trying to pet your dog. <laughs> yeah, man. They're all the same. Typical human. <laughs> Typical human. Dogs like me. They all dogs like me. I should be able to pet your dog anytime I want. You were being a typical human there, Kevin. <laughs> uh, we know better now, boys. <laughs> all right. Next paragraph down. Continuing in the book. To complicate matters a little more. A dog might show dominance aggression only in very specific circumstances. It might occur only in one specific place or at a certain time. This is common with grooming. A dog might fight grooming if you normally carry it out in the kitchen at lunchtime, but if you unexpectedly do it first thing in the morning outdoors, he may not show his usual dominance aggression. Some dogs can be psychologically dominant but physically submissive. This is particularly true of some, or he talks about some breeds. Anyway, we're not gonna go down the breed thing here. Uh, you know, but sometimes uh, just location, context could be where the dog's displaying dominance, but not out of context, you know what I'm saying? Um, some dogs may look physically submissive, but if they get into that fight or flight situation, they're gonna become dominant or decide to put up a fight, you know what I'm saying? So that kind of stuff, we have to pay attention to it. You know what I'm saying? And it's not like with everything with dogs, it's not like it's not like black and white all the time, especially when we're analyzing behavior, psychology, the dog's mind, especially for us because we're doing, you know, how we're going out and doing consultations, talking to people, evaluating their dog, that type of stuff. You got to, like, this is why our process of uh, certifying a trainer is so detailed because you can't, you can't learn this stuff in two weeks. Right. You can't learn this stuff in two months. It's like you got to go through it. You got to do X amount of dogs and try and see. And even after your, uh, that, you still got to learn more. You yeah. still got to do more. It's like, you know, I see things today and I've been training for years now that I haven't seen before, you know? And yeah. for some reason, this has been happening more recently than others, you know? <laughs> I've been like, well, this is the first time this has ever happened, you know, these types of scenarios. But uh, with the dog, it's not black and white. Different things are going on. You could see submissive, you could see dominance, you know, back to back. You could see a little bit at the same time. You could see aggression, you could see, uh, you know, insecurity at the same time, you know, separate in the same dog, depending on the scenario. It's, it's crazy, all these different things you see, but understanding what we're talking about helps you uh, get through all that mess and understand what you need to do, especially as a professional trainer, to help that dog become better you know, to help that family, you know what yeah. I'm saying? Well, in this line of work, it is a, you know, learn every day thing, like yeah. strive to learn every day. Because with all the dogs in the world, you know, you got all these mixes, all these different issues, all of these different reinforcement histories, how they were raised as a puppy, all this different stuff. Mm. You can't just train them one way, you know what I mean? And that's yeah. where you get the trainers who are like, oh, I can't, your dog's untrainable, see you later. You yeah. know, and it's yeah. not true. Yeah. All right, back to the book, next paragraph, second sentence, page 113. What happens? is that the dog perceives his owner to be weak. Mm. Bam. Don't be weak. Hard pill to swallow. Yep. <laughs> All right, so real quick, this goes back to the dog doesn't expect, expect equality. The dog is looking to find its place in the pecking order, especially if we're dealing with a very dominant dog. You know, if the owner's not stepping up to be a strong leader in that dog's mind. You know what I'm saying? Like an owner may have two dogs over a course of let's say 10 years you know what i'm saying their first dog 
may have responded very well to little uh, little things here and there. They didn't really need to do that much with that dog. Then they get a second dog and it's a dominant dog. And now what they're, what they're used to doing with their first dog is not working. You know, and that second dog, the more dominant one, from their perspective, they're perceiving their owner as a, as a weak leader. You know, even though the owner may not be a weak person, they're perceiving what they're doing as a weak pack leader. So what we have to do is coach that owner to become, to become a strong pack leader from their dog's perspective. Mm -hmm. And it comes down to the routine, the structure, the exercise, what you're doing. And also, uh, you know, you got to look at it from the dog's perspective. You can't say, oh, my dog's a fluffy golden retriever. You know, it's a dog. Yeah. You know, I got to make sure that I uh, follow through with what I'm asking you to do. That kind of stuff. You know what I'm saying? Back to the book. If my dog comes over and asks to be stroked, mm -hmm. and I go. stroke her. That's where I got that from. <laughs> <laughs> I'm rewarding her initiative, right? So just like what Kevin talked about earlier, if your dog comes over and muzzle nudges you, let's say you're watching TV, dog comes over, muzzle nudges you, and you're, you're petting them, you're rewarding the initiative of dominance, right? Well, and I see it, so like the way his, his wording, he says if a dog comes over and asks to be stroked, I see it from the dog's perspective is they are coming over to demand, demand to be yeah. stroked. You exactly. know what I'm saying? That's true. Um, so that's dominance. Yeah. Interesting usage of the word stroking here. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> really? <laughs> Back to the book. But at the same time, I'm telling her, right? We're talking about the dog that comes over asking to be stroked. But at the same time, I'm telling her that I obey her commands. Dominance can be as subtle as that. When dogs interpret our behavior as a reaction to theirs, their natural inclination is to feel more assertive and dominant. Uh, that's good stuff right there. Yeah, it is. It's good shit. You ever seen the Shiba, was it Shiba Inu, Shiba Inu, whatever? The uh, Japanese dogs kind of look like corgis. Yeah, I've seen them. Yeah, you ever see the one where like when she she's hungry, she grabs the bowl and like throws it and oh, barks right. at the I owners? I haven't seen it. <laughs> demanding <laughs> i gotta show you that video we'll see what i'm what i'm thinking here is what we tell people every time we train a dog every time we work with a family your dog has to earn everything they're doing right yeah. so let's take an example it's meal time right my dog knows it's meal time so my dog like you just said <laughs> goes over to their food bowl demanding food <laughs> you know they may not be saying anything but the fact that they're walking over there staring at me is demanding the food so what would i do after training, you know, after they know training and stuff, like obedience work, I'd send them to their spot. I'd put them in a downstay. Mm -hmm. I'd prepare their food. And then I would allow them to go get the food. So instead of putting the food there because they're standing there demanding it, I then have them redirect to something else and then come back for the food on my terms. You know what I'm saying? So that's a real quick way that if you're seeing some of this uh, subtle dominance, subtle reactions, uh, stuff like that you can easily redirect it mm -hmm. and then take control of the situation to assert yourself as the dominant uh leader in the pack and it's cool. very easy you yeah know what I'm and that's so like that brings up a good point also when we talk about dominance because i hear this a lot when we when we tell people hey you know you might have some dominance or whatever people think dominant means physically you know physically overpowering your dog oh, yeah. being the big bad <laughs> boss of the house yeah. that is a perfect example how you can be dominant over your dog and show them their place in the hierarchy without getting it without doing anything physical whatsoever yeah. so don't feel like you know okay well I, I've got to be the strongest person in my household and I got to throw my dog around and do all this crazy stuff that a lot of a lot of people and unfortunately trainers yeah. um, do it's not about that let's be honest we don't we don't condone we don't believe in alpha rolling yeah. rolling your dog over yeah. right. You're just going to get, they're going to correct you back at that point. Exactly. You're going to get your face. you got a yeah. highly dominant dog, you know. Yeah. And we've got some, uh, you know, we've got some people that we work with that, you know, aren't big people. And they might have more dominant dogs and they handle it yeah. through their structure, mm -hmm. through their routine, through their exercise. You got to be, you got to be on it. You know what I'm saying? If you identify this scenario we just talked about, mm. the food scenario, the petting you scenario, or coming up to get stroked scenario, you know, that type of stuff. Do a quick redirect, and then you can bring them back over to you and pet them at that point. Because now you know it's on your terms. Now Not it's sure. on your terms, yeah. Mm -hmm. So if I'm sitting on the couch watching TV, my dog approaches me, muzzle nudges me, I might send him to spot. I might just ignore him. I might uh, put him in a downstay. I might have him do something else, and then a couple minutes later, call him to me, and then pet them. Mm -hmm. Now it's on my terms. Mm -hmm. Now I'm the one 
displaying dominance. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So very important, you know. All right, back to the book. A uh, couple sentences at the end of this uh, little paragraph here. When we try to... Uh, here we go. Here we go, boys. <laughs> when we try to win our dog's affection by responding to their demands, we can unwittingly be creating a feeling of dominance in their minds. Mm. Ugh, You're slap, feeding it. Slap it. Slap the table with that one. Not this table. This might break. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When we try to win our dog's affection by responding to their demands, we can unwittingly be creating a feeling of dominance in their minds. So how many people have we seen that, you know, oh, my dog, uh, you're such a good boy, walk over, pet him for nothing. How many times have we seen him give you a treat, you know, for nothing, you know? <laughs> you're giving them dominance because you are doing everything. Uh, you're just giving them everything for nothing. You're showing them all this attention for nothing, you know what I'm saying? They're running the house, you, you give it to them for nothing, you know what I'm saying? Holy cow, this is creating dominance, creating an issue potentially in some dogs. You know, some dogs may not create an issue, but others, I'm telling you, yeah. could create an issue, you know? All right, back to the book. Next sentence. Dominance aggression is both inherited and learned. So sometimes it's genetic. Sometimes they're learning it through what you're doing, such as uh, you're trying to win their affection by responding to their demands. That's that's them learning to be dominant. You know what I'm saying? And it's it's both at the same time in a, in a worst time. case scenario. <laughs> oh, yeah, if you got both, oh, stand by. You know. <laughs> All right, and back to the book. Next <laughs> sentence, or skip one sentence. The hormonal influence on this behavior probably occurred near birth, when the male's pup brain was masculinized by a surge of testosterone. So they do get a surge of testosterone before they're even born, right? This is why castration, neutering, has little beneficial effect on correcting this unpleasant behavior. Boom. So a lot of people say, you know, I'm going to get my dog neutered. That'll fix the aggression. That'll fix the dominance. No, it won't, mm -hmm. you know, because all this that we're talking about, you get this testosterone surge before they're even born. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's going to have no effect to get them neutered. You know, all right, next page, 114. Let's see, uh, second paragraph halfway down, one sentence out of the second paragraph, he says uh, that allowing a dog to get his own way permits and potentiates dominant behavior. So we've already kind of touched on this, but allowing your dog to get his own way permits and potentiates dominant behavior. So he gives a couple of examples. Backing away from a growl, allowing the dog to win tug of war games. We'll talk about that in a second. Letting him wander freely. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> allowing him to jump on people. Wow. Permissiveness creates problems, but this aspect of dominance aggression can be overcome through retraining, right? All right, so backing away from a growl, a dog may growl at you. You know, it's a warning sign, but they may be growling at you for a variety of reasons. But if it's a dominance reason, if you back away, you're just, boom, teaching him that he can be more dominant. You know what I'm saying? Teach him, you, you just growl at me and you can get whatever you want. Exactly, yeah. And I'm not saying to, uh, you know, if a dog's growling at you to, to grab the dog or do something. Yeah. You need to understand what to do in that situation, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, just know that if you're backing, constantly backing away from a growl, you could be potentiating a problem, especially if it's a dominant aggression problem. You know what I'm saying? All right, allowing the dog to win tug of war games. So for us, we like playing tug of war because that is a bonding experience with your dog. Like my personal dog, it was a great way for him to learn his role in the pack. But we have rules to playing tug of war. It's not a free for all. Number one, the toys are always our toys, right? So we don't leave toys around the house, around the yard. We keep them stored, and whenever we bring them out, we play. When the play session's over, we say, all done. We put the toy away. You know what I'm saying? So we are controlling the play session. Yes, during the tug-of-war game, we're going to let the dog win the tug. We're going to let them run around with it, have a good time, possess it. But they're going to bring it back to us, and we're going to keep playing tug. But at the very end, we're going to tell them to out. We're going to put that toy away. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, Even though we're having that fun interaction there still are rules and expectations in place yep which keeps us as the dominant member in the pack you know mm -hmm. what i'm saying uh, letting him wander freely so if your dog's wandering around the house freely 
around the yard freely, boom, that they could be perceiving that as their territory, their pack, and they're going to run things, you know? So sometimes they need to be in a kennel. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they need to be in a downstate. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they need to be in a spot. Sometimes you need to have a boundary of when they may or may not be allowed in certain rooms or uh, on certain furniture, stuff like that, right? Managing what they can do, allowing him to jump up on people. Obviously, that's a bad behavior, So, but it could be dominance, you know what I'm saying? Could be, but for the most part, that's not really going to be dominance related, you know, but it could be in some situations. All right, thoughts on that, guys? Good. All right, next page, page 115. So the author of the book at this point is talking about some prevention we can take to prevent dominance aggression. The first sentence he says is that uh, dominance aggression can best be avoided through careful selection of a dog in the first place. So if you're going out looking for puppies, you know, we'll go out and look at puppies with anybody that wants us to look at them, tell you what, we're, what we see. Maybe we see some anxieties, insecurities, dominance all these types of things you should take into account when you're trying to select a puppy. And if you're not really geared for, you're not the type of person that likes a dominant dog like me, <laughs> I like the challenge, you know, but uh, if you're not into the highly dominant dogs, you know, you don't want to get a puppy that's dominant because that's just going to be issues down the, down the road. You know what I'm saying? So careful selection in the first place is going to be critical. Don't just look at a puppy and say, that one's pretty because it's got mm. this color coat. You know, it's got this, it's got that. It's the biggest puppy in the litter, you know. It's the happiest. Yeah. Look at the, you need to look at what's actually going on and you need a professional to help you do that. That's huge. I mean, because I think that would address a lot of issues that we run into. Yeah. And I think we, uh, we, we probably need to do an episode on just selection of yeah. dogs because that's, that's huge. Yeah. You know, select a, a dog that's going to fit you and your family. Exactly. And you know, uh, let's say that uh, you send out some questions to a breeder to ask about this, ask about that. Some breeders get angry if you ask questions. <laughs> Stay away from that person, you know what I'm saying? Because if they're not willing to have a talk with you about your dog and help you find the dog that's in the best interest for you and your family, probably not a good person you want to be working with. Yeah, like if you're going through a breeder, like I'm going to want to see the dog's parents. The parents. Or, you know, like, yeah. and if they're kind of standoffish about that, why? Why is that? You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, you definitely want to see the parents. Adam. Parents, scenarios, yeah. you know, all kinds of good stuff. Exactly. Just uh, go to those monks in, uh, was it Maine? Yeah. 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 Good monks of New, nice New, German New York, I think. Yeah. Good to go. All right, page 115, bottom of the first paragraph, he talks about uh, avoiding puppies from parents that are known to be aggressive in a dominant way. Right? So we just talked about that. But look at the parents. How are the parents? You know what I'm saying? All right, page 115, uh, third paragraph down, uh, middle of the paragraph, he says, the absolute law is that he must do something for you before you do something for him. So we already talked about that, but basically uh, don't let your dog get his own way. Don't do things on his terms or her terms. It's got to be on your terms. Yep. You know what I'm saying? And it's just little things, easy yeah. little things. You want to go outside, sit at the door. Yep, exactly. Yep. All right. So then the next section of the book is called uh, Treating Dominance Aggression. So this is how he treats it, okay, or what he's saying. Uh, bottom of the first page here, he says, uh, or page 115, he says that the dominant dog must learn that nothing is for free. So again, we're hashing this over and over, right? He's got to know where his place is in the pecking order. The absolute law is that he must do something for you before you do something for him. You cannot allow him to get his own way. You know, you cannot respond to his initiative. You know, the dominant dog must learn that nothing is for free. So all these things are just compounding, right? We keep hitting, hitting it over and over and over, right? All right, so page 116, uh, second paragraph, he talks about the downstay being very important because it's a subservient position, submissive position which we talk about a lot, you know, use that downstay to your advantage, right? Have your dog perform downstays, practice your downstays, right? Uh, he also says in the book uh, that the next sentence, there are two sentences down, is that the aggression problem is between your dog and his pack, which is your family, right? So again, it's not necessarily just the dog's issue, it's a pack issue, right? Next paragraph down. 
Oh, this is this is a hard hitter right here. All right, page 116. Yeah, he says that we're going to read the whole paragraph. We probably won't get through it before we have to stop. In the book, he says, as, pre as preconditions to training, he's talking about training the dominant dog. He says, to remove all of your dog's valued assets, his toys, his bones, even his blanket. Oh, his blanket. His blanket. His blanket. His blanket. This is serious business, right? Because these are all things your dog has taken possession of. He has to learn that these are your items. You are allowing him to use them. So you got to go back, remove them, and start from square one and slowly allow him to earn them back. Notice it says all your dog's valued assets. All right? Assets. So this isn't like, oh, I'm just going to do this with food, right? But I'm going to leave water out for him all day. Mm -hmm. Or he can still have his toys, right? No. Everything that he values is yours now. Yep. This is serious business. Back to the book. This is serious business I'm, I'm not even kidding i mean i've been through this with my dog you know what i'm saying that's why i'm like this is serious you know back to the book do not give in to your human emotions do not give in to your human emotions that's so hard to do but he looks so sad when i took his blanket away I know. yeah yeah no it is i mean i dude i'll i'll be the first to admit when you i was doing this when you were, yeah i mean it was hard you know like <laughs> well yeah. sometimes i just want to cuddle with my dog like it's that's normal but that's a human emotion we're addre addressing something serious right now yep. you know that's a human emotion that's not how your dog's thinking right nope. especially a dominant dog they don't yeah. care about cuddling. No. nope <laughs> cuddling to them is them them taking dominance yep. you know what i'm saying back to the book think only on his terms you want to be in command and will do anything to, to usurp the power he has usurped from you, right? Do you want control of your dog? Do you want to be able to take your dog places? Do you want to be able to say something and your dog respond? Or do you just want your dog to run the family? Do you want to live in a stressful life? Do you want to live in anxiety because you don't know what your dog's going to do? All right. Whew. Next, next uh, sentence here. You getting tired there, Pastor? I'm, I'm freaking. <laughs> Come on, I'm preach on it. Fire now. Right Bring now. it on us. Lay it on us. Next parrot, Next sentence. And remember, aggression is the most common cause of death in young dogs. They don't die as a direct consequence of aggression. They are destroyed by us because of it. How many times have we seen it? How many times? My dog's aggressive. They put the dog. I put him down. They put him down. Don't want to address it. Just put him yeah. down. And we call that execution. You executed. They your had, dog. and they'll say though they had to be put down. Right. They, they had to. Be. Dogs aren't there supposed was no to be other like this. They were too aggressive. Yeah. But in reality, you're letting your dog. Be if like you that. took ownership, yeah, and you thought about it from your dog's terms, not your human terms, you had to change your whole way of thinking. That would that would not be needed. It's not needed. You know what I'm saying? You executed you, you your have, dog. You don't have what it takes, or you don't. You're not willing to do what it takes to address right. this kind of stuff. It's uh, you know. Exactly. I wish more uh, veterinarians would know this. I know there's some that just won't do it because you want them to do it, yeah. but would be able to like redirect you, give you some tips on how to how to handle it instead of saying, okay, 150 bucks. You know right. what I mean? If you're putting down a dog because of a because of aggression. We're talking about two year old dog here, man. You yeah. know right. what I mean? If you're putting down a dog because of aggression, you're executing your dog. Yep. Euthanization is used for dogs that are so old and medically unfit to where they could not live yeah. a suitable life because, be of mercy. Health, because of health issues, right. not behavioral issues. Behavioral issues are resolved. Yeah. What are the, what are the, that book you read, that per, the author said there's three ways to, to deal with it, treat it, management, execute. Or kill them, yeah, or kill them. murder, execution. That's, that's the perspective. Right from a lot of people, you can either treat, treat the uh, behavioral issue, which means rehabilitate it, train it. You can manage it, which means the way that you're living, you know, you manage the dog around your lifestyle to manage the issue without treating it, or you can execute them, right, because of that issue. Unacceptable, yeah. unacceptable. Obviously, we like the training, rehabilitation, treating of the issue, management, okay, you know, a little bit of both is what you need. Honestly, all three of us have dogs. All three of us at this table have dogs that other people would have put down. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, 100%. Definitely, 100%. definitely, you know, unacceptable, you know. All right, back to the book. We're getting off that pedestal. Back to the book. <laughs> all right. You got to let them know, man. Uh, avoid confrontations in which your dog may win 
and the winning on his part puts retraining back considerably. So real quick on that, that's what we call extinction. So we don't let them practice their dominant uh, behaviors. So eventually they could be become extinct. But with, with a dominant dog, you're going to need to do training and extinction at the same time. Yeah. You know? Yep. So like I would also add to that, adding to avoiding confrontations in which your dog may win, set up confrontations in which you win. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah, set, set yourself up for success. Exactly. You know, set yourself up for success. Uh, back to the book. Don't physically punish a dominant aggressive dog. Hitting him can simply stimulate further dominance. Don't physically punish any any dog. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's different ways. To even like a uh, <laughs> even like correct. a correction with a leash and a correction collar or choke chain prong collar, whatever. Hmm. With some dominant dogs, that can provoke dominance. Right. You want to correct me? I'll correct you. Yep. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been through that. You know what I'm saying? That's not gonna work. You know, that's not gonna. Uh, <laughs> back when I was working uh, with other trainers before the revolution started, you know. Uh, Nobody could resolve or nobody could figure out the issues that we were dealing with, with uh, my dog, you know, because they were physical, uh, physical, corrective type people. You know what I'm saying? When you, when I figured out to get into the dog's mind and rehab the mind, that's where the key to success is. But it takes more time. Yeah. People don't like, people don't have patience. Oh, yeah. They want it done. They want it done now. Right. You know, nope. but just like, you know, you're a dog being highly dominant. They don't respond to that type exactly. of training. Exactly. So then that expert's going to tell you, can't happen. Your dog can't be trained. They got to be put down. Right. Just like yeah. The, just Executed. Like, oh, my God. The consultations that I've been through where I've heard that. Yeah. Oh, the other trainer said I should just put her down. Yes. Crazy. Yeah. Just like if you're a, a cop or if you're a soldier in the military or like, you know, uh, corrections or anywhere, business world. You may have, let's say you're a manager or you're a shift, super, shift supervisor or a sergeant or something like that. There might be somebody on your team that you have to deal with that's a little bit dominant. You know what I'm saying? A dominant, a more dominant person. And do you think that physically punishing them is going to work? Do you think that yelling at them, hammering them with uh, punishments, whether that be whatever type of punishment it is, is going to work? No, that's not going to work. You know, you've got to get to their mind. You've got to change your mindset and work with them and help them change their mindset to get on the same page. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? So it goes back to that as well. Same thing. Yeah. Same thing, you know. All right, back to the book. Uh, he repeats again that castration or neutering has little effect on dominance aggression. Uh, and that he says that the bad news is that the problem can never be eliminated you know, so you're going to have to manage this dog. You're going to rehabilitate it. You're going to train it. But it's going to be something that you're always going to have to manage by keeping your pack structure at home tight, mm. keeping your training tight, maintaining yeah. your training. So that, that's a big one, too, because that's a, lot, that's a big misconception for a lot of people. Like, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to go pay for this dog training for my dog, and I'm going to get them trained. Yep. Right? We forget dogs are, we don't forget, but people forget in general, dogs are living beings. They're not robots. It's not like a one and done, cool, they're trained. They're never gonna, they're never gonna be dominant now. They're never gonna, no, this is something, this is a lifestyle now that you have to continually manage and, and address. Exactly. All right, one thing I do wanna talk about before we wrap this episode up is uh, in the book, he does talk some, some methods you could use to uh, show dominance. And he specifically says, grabbing each side of a dog's neck, lifting it up, shaking it, staring at them. I do not recommend doing that. Do not try that, especially with if you decide to get this book and you read it. Again, with everything that we read and we talk about here at The Revolution, there's good things to take away from everything, and sometimes there's things you don't want to use, you know what I'm saying? Or you don't, you absolutely, you're like, hey, we're not doing that for sure. I can tell you, some of the dogs we deal with, you do this, <laughs> you're going to the hospital. You're, you're gonna be, you're gonna be hurting. You know what I'm saying? That that highly dominant dog is gonna put it, some damage into you. You know what I'm saying? Dogs are very powerful, especially dominant ones. Yeah. You know, and if you go about it the wrong way, you could be in trouble. You could, you could be seriously injured. You could even be, uh, you know, hurt seriously, lethally hurt. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Some of these dogs are very powerful. I mean, if you think, like we've talked, we've talked about, uh, you know, like the wolf pack and stuff, when you have these dominant uh, disputes in the hierarchy, a lot of times they say with the wolves, uh, the only way that's resolved is through death. 
Yeah. So I mean, like the fight is on at that point, right. you know. So I mean, you That's in the you end. start, yeah, exactly. You start getting physical like this, um, in their mind, instinctually, genetically, the fight's on. Right. You know what exactly. I'm saying? You just you don't want to put yourself in that situation, especially in the dog world, because I don't think you know, expulsion. The dog's not gonna you know, expel us from our own home. So what would they go to? Yep. Elimination. You yep. know. Yep. Exactly. Well, yeah, like anything, take it with a grain of salt. It's 2020. Some of these things are very old school. <laughs> <laughs> methods you know what yeah. i mean but we've yeah. definitely evolved since then yeah we continue to evolve yep. as we continue to learn and we continue to uh, gain more experience every dog we train we gain more experience we start to learn to handle situations just a little bit differently you know what i'm saying uh but you know very important information right here this is why we had to do this emergency podcast episode he was the only one that knew it was an emergency <laughs> i was caught off guard cameras on i was like what what we're doing an episode <laughs> right now I mean, this information is critical. Yeah. We have to get this out there, you know. Uh, this book, again, is called The Dog's Mind, and we're on page 112 to 116 is what we went through today. And, uh, you know, critical information. Dogs are pack animals. They don't expect equality. Think about it from your dog's perspective, not your perspective. That's the hardest part. Mm-hmm. Do not give in to your human emotions. Come on. That's hard. That's super hard. Even for us sometimes, you know, (laughs) but you just got to do it. You got to think like a dog, you know what I'm saying? Sometimes, sometimes you got to think like a human when you're dealing with humans, you know, because guess what? If we train a dominant dog, we get them good to go. Now we got to train the owners. So we have to think like the dog. Then we have to think like the owner's thinking, you know what I'm saying? Get them on the same page. So, but anyway, dominance is something that, uh, you know, all dogs have some form of dominance. Some dogs are going to be more dominant than others. So know what you're dealing with. Know what's going on. If you don't know, ask for help. You know, hit us up. We're more than happy to do a complimentary consultation. Come by your place. Talk to you about your dog. If you're out of the area, we've trained many dogs from out of state, across the country. We even have a dog in Guatemala, you know, international. So, uh, you know, if you need some help, let us know. Send us a video if you're somewhere else. We'll give you our two cents. You know what I'm saying? Go from there. All right. But anyway, that wraps up this episode of Canine Revolution Radio. We appreciate all of our listeners out there. Thank you for your support. We're continuing to try and get more content up to you guys. Check us out on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Uh, please let us know what you think about the podcast. Please let us know other information you'd like to know about. And until next time. We'll see y'all next. Until next time, we'll see y'all next time. (laughs) All right, guys, have a good one.